Hi guys and welcome back to the next lesson of our series Blender for Production, the 2D and 3D tracking workflow. My name is Helge Maus from Pixel Train. This time we will have a shorter lesson, but a really important one. We want to talk about so named nodal shots or tripod shots. The question is what are they and why they are so dangerous? So let's get started. For this, I've loaded here a little bit of footage of my footage package, which you know you can get on my Patreon or also on Gumroad for a really small fee. But feel free to use your own footage so you learn a lot with your own projects. And if you want to support me, subscribe and give me a thumbs up. I'm really happy if you do that. So let's get started with this scene here. The topic nodal shot is, like I've said, a dangerous one because I see many newbies or sometimes it even happens to me that I start tracking a shot and I do something and then suddenly I see, oh, it's a nodal shot. This is something you always have to check before you work because you can really lose a lot of production time in shots like that. In this lesson now, I want to talk not only about the nodal shot himself, but also about the problems which you have if you try to solve a nodal shot with classic tools. So it's really a helper so that you really can see what happens. And I hope I install you a alarm bell in your hat. If these problems occur, please test if it's a nodal shot. Let's take now a look into the shot. As always, we try to analyze before we are tracking if this shot has problematic areas and so on. And like I've said, it's a nodal shot, so this is something you should see. But let's talk about the other stuff. So we talked about, is this shot trackable? Do we have areas which we can track? Do we have enough features? Do we have dangerous things like, for example, reflections here? Or lines which are crossing here from different depth here? And we get here sliding of trackers. Do we have patterns? Do we have moving objects? All the stuff we talked about in the previous lessons. And normally, if I present this shot here to my trainees, most trainees directly see, oh, this is an easy shot. And they also don't see that we don't have any parallax because they say, yeah, we have these balconies here. We have houses in different depth here. And also, if you go here to the starting point, we have some trees in the foreground which give us enough Z information. So they say directly, yeah, this shot is easy and they start tracking supervised track or semi-automatic track. Let's try this. I use for this the semi-automatic tracking approach only because I'm lazy and I know that I don't want to use the result of this experiment later for production. So let's do that. I go here to the first frame. Then we go here into the tracking settings. We use F fine. We want to normalize the lighting. We go here to the correlation and set it to 90%. And because we will wipe away trackers here in the border areas, I increase here a little bit the border margin to let's say five pixels or so. If these options here are new to you, Please look into the other tutorials, which were before that one. We have a whole series of tracking tutorials, which are best watched in order. So you get every information you need about the 2D and 3D tracking process. So I only make now my settings here, go to the first frame. And now we detect our features. So click here. Now we have a whole bunch of features. Normally we now would remove all the features which we don't like on dangerous areas, but this here is only experiment. So control T for tracking forward. They are thinning out like always. We have some zombies here now in the viewport. I don't like to see them. So alt D or you can go to the display and say deactivate show disabled so that we only see what's active in the moment. And you see they are thinning out here more and more. Let's go to the last frame here. Let's scroll out here a little bit to see the whole timeline. Here we go. And now we detect some more features here. Normally you sort now all of these. Everyone here is selected. So command shift T for tracking backwards this time. Okay. Now we have an area where we don't have any trackers. So let's go in the middle frame 150, make some new trackers. Here we have a reflection. This is something I don't want. And maybe we have some more stuff which we find dangerous, but 
don't do too much so we track the whole thing forward if you have done something here now you have deselected the other ones so i select everything here again go into this direction and into this direction it seems that we have now enough trackers and if you go here into our tracking derp sheet you also see everything is gray you know from the other lessons that this background indicates with red green and gray if we have enough trackers in every frame to solve that so blender says yeah everything is okay but a good habit is i press the m key like mute to get rid here of the background for a moment if you search that in the menu you can go here to clip display and use this eye symbol here and now i scrub over the whole thing and try to analyze here if we have enough trackers and if we have a good distribution of trackers or if some trackers also make crazy stuff so if a tracker goes into a wrong direction you would see that here quite good so let's check that here we have enough trackers they are thinning out now here and maybe you find now a gap here where you say yeah i need here some more trackers and so on so feel free to detect some more features if you like so let's go now through here then suddenly the camera move changes we go now upwards but you see it seems that we have enough trackers here in all the frames maybe in some frames we can have some more but it's only an experiment so let's try that i press m again to go back now here and now we go to the solver settings before we do that let's go here to tracking camera and set our camera settings which we want to have i want to have a sensor size of 36 millimeter here horizontal which is full frame you also can go here to the presets and say that i want to have a full frame here if we go to the lens we can set a focal length here i don't remember i think it's in the 35 or so but let's try something here and we can refine that later if we like then we have to set here our keyframes we talked about keyframes in our introduction lesson to 3d tracking and for this i have made you a schematic drawing where i showed you how to get the right keyframes and you remember one rule of the keyframes was that we need the same eight trackers in both keyframes and we need a parallax for that and the background of a nodal shot is don't have parallax so to get around that we can cheat a little bit we say i don't have any clue here we can test that or we can make an automatic keyframe search let's do both we click here solve camera motion and try to get a solve you see we have a solve now which looks quite terrible 28 pixels off this can be also bad trackers so maybe you haven't found that this here is a nodal shot or it can be that we have not the best keyframes let's test the thing again what if we tell blender to search its own keyframes so tick that and try again it takes a while and now we are so happy we have now a solve error of one pixel without doing anything with focal length or with lens distortion so like i said nodal shots are a dangerous beast you are really running into the problem that you think that the solve is quite good before you then realize what is happening let's go into focal length and try to find a good focal length we have a software error of one at the moment focal length is 24 i think we have to go to the 30s let's try it takes quite a long time and now you see the software error is better you feel more safe and we are in the 30s it seems that everything works like expected let's do the last thing we normally do a little bit of distortion we have a soft error of 0 0.9 and now it can happen that suddenly the soft error goes up no it goes down now we are really on the safe side right what you now can do to get an even better solve is we can go into our curves again and search for the spikies remember if you have a spike in the middle of a curve like this one here normally means these are speed curves that the tracker suddenly starts to move extremely fast and this is really often an indicator that this tracker has a problem it's bad so let's go here now to this point and if we now take a look here you see it really lost here contact so 
Where is this guy? I think. Where is it? Let's search for it. Here it is at this point. You see, it moved here around a lot. So if you have a spike, normally I go here and say delete it. Don't delete these here. We talked about that when we talked about the semi automatic tracking. So you can refer to these lessons because these are speed curves. So if a tracker appears or disappears, there's a strong speed change and so we get this here but if it's in the middle it's in most cases a good sign that this tracker here is going crazy somehow let's test this guy here and you see yeah it really goes crazy let's kill them here to really have the feeling that we have done something here to improve the tracking result uh, what's this guy? Okay, this is the beginning and so on. Yeah, here we have some trackers doing crazy stuff. What you also can do is we can use here the cleanup session. Sometimes we have really short trackers, but most of these trackers seem to be quite long. So I don't think that we have to sort trackers out. Maybe we have some. So let's kill every tracker which is shorter than five frames. Do that. Make sure that you haven't selected anything. So Alt A here only to make sure that nothing here is selected. And Alt D to get the zombies back only to make sure that nothing here is selected. So everything is now open. We click here to clear track and now maybe we have selected some of these guys here which we can then kill. But you see there's no one to kill here under five frames and you can use that. Another thing which you can use is you have a solve error. We have a solve error here of 0 0.74. And if we go here into our dope sheet and sort the list here by the average error and invert the list, you see the trackers with the highest error are around three here. So we can say, let's kill some trackers which are over one, for example. What I normally do is I save before I do that. Sometimes going back is a little bit buggy, so save it, try it, Alt A to deactivate all selections, click clean tracks again. Now we have some here selected and we see here a guy with crossing lines, here another guy with crossing lines. This here seems also to be a crossing line, interesting. So kill them because these trackers are trackers with a high error here. Everything is still gray, that's good. And now I can try to resolve again. We don't need to recalculate here the distortion again and also the focal length because they are here in the camera settings now. We can go here and now try to get the solve error even lower. And now you see shock. We have an extreme high solve error. Like I said, a nodal shot is a beast. You have sometimes extremely strange behaviors. You made something better and suddenly the soft error goes up or something like that. This is one indicator that something is wrong with the shot. Another good indicator is, let's save that, make a tracking scene built here. And now let's add here under general a new 3D layout. Select our camera and go to the viewport overlays and activate the motion tracking options and the camera path only to see what's going on here. Let's take a look here, the background image. Here it is. We can make this more opaque, but you see something is really wrong. You see your camera is doing <laughs> extremely strange stuff. It rotates around, it flips around. You see here, all your trackers are placed in a bunch here behind the camera and in front of the camera. Sometimes you have trackers all around the scene here, but if you then compare it to the real scene, it doesn't make any sense. And these are all indicators of a nodal shot. So we know where the problems are. Now we try really to solve the thing here. So how to get rid of all this stuff here first? We don't have to get rid of the trackers because they are 2D trackers. Or better to say, we tracked it first 2D and the 2D stuff is still valid. 
The only thing is that 3D Solve doesn't make sense. So what I do now here is I go here, Shift S for the tracking menu and I clear out the solution. And if you clear it out, you see the 3D is now gone. We don't have a solve error anymore. If you want, you can also clear out here the stuff which was generated for you. But keep in mind that in compositing and so we still have stuff, but not important at the moment. Alt D to get rid of the zombies. And what we now do is we go back to the solve panel. If you have a nodal or tripod shot, what does it mean? If you are taking a camera and you rotate it around one point, the center point of your optics, this is meant a nodal shot. You have one pivot point or nodal point which you are using. And this generates the problem that you don't have any parallax. The most extreme version of that is if you use a tripod. If you use a tripod, you have a perfect rotation point. And so most people refer to this, like Blender does it, that this is a tripod shot. But this here is a handheld shot and it still is a nodal shot. Why? Because I was rotating around myself. And yes, I have not a perfect nodal point. My camera was a little bit in front of the rotation. But still, the parallax is so, so low that you don't have a good parallax here. If you have the typical tourist shot, you are rotating around yourself. And even if you go left, right, and then up, down, you are rotating around one point. And if this far away, you produce a nodal shot. It doesn't have to be perfect. To solve that now, we go here to tripod because it is not possible for a normal solver to solve a nodal shot because no parallax at all. If you tick that now here, you see that you don't need to search keyframes because they don't do anything because we don't have parallax. So we don't need keyframes at all. And the rest here is normal. So what you can do is I go here and I zero out here my Lens distortion, if you want, you can use the focal length, but we start again with 24. It was around that here when we started, only to show you the process again. And now I go here to solve camera motion and we wait now. And you see the solve is extremely fast and our solve error is high, 9 pixel. This is really common because this is a handheld nodal shot. If you have really a good nodal shot with a tripod, it's much, much better but this here is not a perfect nodal shot. So the software is okay at the moment. So now we try the same thing. We go to a focal length here, make that, and you will see that the focal length goes into the same direction. I think 38.5 is a good value. And what you also can try here, we are, by the way, in the soft error of 1.6, quite better, not perfect, but better. We can also use here the lens distortion and we are still better. These are the things we can do. And if you now have a good shot, you have normally to search now for bad trackers. Same thing like in normal solving. So I think here we can find some trackers which are not perfect, which we can sort out. But let's see that as a homework for you. We talked about good trackers, bad trackers, and you even can solve the whole thing with uh, supervised tracking, which is in production much better than such a semi-automatic track. You see how many trackers we have here on branches and things like that, which is maybe quite dangerous to solve. But that's not the topic of today's tutorial. Let's look now into 3D space. So for this, we set up our tracking scene again. And we go back here in our layout and now take a look what we have now here. And now you see something interesting. It doesn't look more logical than before. You see we have a camera here. And if you don't see the tracking marks, please make sure that motion tracking and camera path here is on. It's important. And all our trackers are sitting here on a sphere. This is a spherical shape and the movement of the camera is around its center point. You see, that's the idea of a nodal shot. You have only a rotation of the camera, which can be in X and Y or let's say horizontal and vertical, but not in space. 
you learned in my illustration of the first lesson of the 3D camera tracking system where I explained how the server works that we need the parallax to decide how deep a point sits in space. As we don't have this information, Blender projects all our points to this sphere. That's now the challenge for you, how to work with that. But we can have now some fun with that. So let's split the window here and go here into the camera. Let's go a little bit closer here. If we now scrubbing around, you will see, let's hide these two, select these two, press the H key like hide. And I don't want to see the grid either here. So let's get rid of that. If we now take a look here, you will see that if you look to the camera, all the points are staying where they belong. So if we have a point, for example, here in the corner of the window and we scrub around, you will see that this point is always staying here if it's a good tracker. That's <laughs> the important part. So you see, that's the idea behind that. So that's the thing the camera stores where in a ray this point is in relation to the camera. And now we can use this knowledge by placing now objects in front of that because if we don't have any parallax here, we don't have parallax errors if we place something in the scene because we have no parallax. In the solving process, it's a disadvantage, but now if you place something, it's an advantage. The problem with that here now is that placing the objects, it's quite hard. So let's Alt H to bring our objects back here. And we go here to the starting point and you see this here doesn't seem to fit at all. So let's do that. I take here the cube and I grab it Z one unit to place it here now on this floor. And the next step what we can do is we can now scale the scene. Maybe you have now the question, why don't you go back here to the motion tracking, go here to orientation and make this here. You will see that this here doesn't really work. We don't have space, we don't have axes and things like that. It doesn't make too much sense to work with that. So what we do here is we have to do it now by hand. To do that, there are some tricks. One thing is, if we don't need a distance here, because everything is on a sphere, we can select the camera, for example, here and scale the camera. And so we move now the points in space here and I move the points maybe a little bit here to the back only to have a better scene size here so that we can work a little bit easier. And I hope you can see here my tracking marks. Next thing is, if you want now to rotate your scene, don't rotate your objects. It's much easier to take the camera the camera itself is hosting these points here. You have seen that when I scaled here. So what you can do is now you can start rotating your camera with the R key and do something like that. But this is sometimes a little bit tricky. What I do now here is I use a little trick. First thing is you use your 3D cursor. The 3D cursor is this crosshair here, which you can place with this tool here or with shift right mouse button click. So you can place this guy here and to center now this point here, you can use your keyboard shortcut shift C, like center shift C on your keyboard, which centers the 3D cursor in the middle of the scene. This is the first step. Next step is I want now to rotate my camera with the scene around this point. So this here should now be the pivot point of my translation because that's the region where this cube sits and this plane. To do that, we can change the transformation model of Blender. If you look here, we have two drop downs which change transformation. So first things first, I show you this with a transformation widget only that you can see it better. This transformation widget here sits at the moment on the selected object here or the pivot point of the selected object. The first menu here is changing the transformation orientation. So in which direction does this widget look? Global means like the scene, local means like the object itself and you see cameras looking into negative Z direction and so on. So this is the orientation which we don't need to change at the moment, maybe in a moment. And this menu here means where the rotation pivot is. So the origin of a transformation. 
And what we normally use here is we search for the median point of a selection. If we have selected more than one point, the transformation pivot is always in the middle. What we can do now here is we tell now the system, please use the 3D cursor for that. And now you see, and that's a tip for beginners, take a widget here, that now the orientation point is here. And you still can use that here if you like, you see? If you want to use this here with the keyboard shortcut, this here, this menu is the comma key. And if you press comma, you see here the orientation of the widget. If you want to do that here where the pivot is, it's the pivot point. And so I use the point on my keyboard and I can change it here. So 3D cursor. And now what we can do is I take now the rotation here. I do it first with the widget and later with keyboard shortcuts. And now I start rotating. I can do it here or here. Here makes maybe more sense to see what's going on. And you take these bands here, but you also can click here inside of that here. And if you now rotate around, you see you are now rotating the whole thing. If it's too fast, you can hold down while you are doing that the shift key. And remember that in Blender, there is no border of the software. So if you hold down shift and I'm here on the left border of the software and I go to the left, in other applications, suddenly the transformation is gone. But in Blender, the widget starts on the right side again. You see, now it's back here. So we can now have a continuous rotation until you have a rotation which you like more. You also can use the bands here. And if the bands are looking into the wrong direction, now comes the second menu. I press the comma key here and say, I want to have it, for example, local to change now here the widget. And also here you can use the shift key while you're doing things like that. So this takes now some time. And you have to do it by yourself now, okay? And what you also can do is you can now take the whole thing and bring it down. So you also can do it now like this. You can say I want to have it global or local and we bring this now down. It's working in the opposite direction because you indirectly move everything here and you look through the same thing, but you get used to that. You also can go here into the wireframe to have it more obvious, but in my case, I would go here to the background image of the camera and bring the visibility a little bit down. And now I have to take some time to do that, but it's a tutorial. I think you can do that better at home. I do that here live, so them sometimes a little bit tricky, but I do my best for you. Let's try something like that here. Okay, let's say that's it. You have taken your time, you try that and so on and so on. Now comes the big moment. Does this here hold? Take the floor, H key. And if you're now looking through the camera, you will see due to the fact that we don't have parallax, which is now the advantage you see that this here is always in the same position in front of this window. And that's the beauty of a nodal shot here. What we now can do is if you have placed it now somehow that it seems that visually it fits. So let's try that. I bring it a little bit more down, bring back the ground. We now can say, let's try it to do that. Now I have brought the ground down, so let's do that here. And I only do that now here because I need a shadow catcher. That's the only thing. Let's say that's okay. Get rid of the viewport. We talked about this setup before in the lesson where I talked about shadow catchers and how this whole rendering setup works. And I rebuilt that fast for you. So I go here to background and I kill first foreground, sorry. I go here to background. Let's name this scene and make sure in the filters that we are looking here into hold out and indirect only to see if we have, yeah, still here some options deactivate that and now we bring all the stuff here into the same collection and kill the light and the collection which we don't need. 
We talked about this setup before, but make sure that we don't have anything going on here. Okay, now everything is here. Let's go to the compositing, which still uses these render layers. So kill these two with the X key. Now we have an empty alpha over. If you want to kill a node without losing the connection, you can use instead of X, control X. You see the connection is then still there. And now we need a new render layer node, which shows scene. So let's go here, input, and we say we need render layers. This is scene. And we use that in this alpha over because this here is the background and this should be the foreground. We don't see anything yet here because we haven't rendered it. But before we render, we have to make some things sure. So I'll first test it here in the viewport. I go now here into rendering and I press the zero key and we see, hmm, we see a grayish background. Reason for this is our scene still has a background which shows the world. So let's go here into the world settings, into the film and say transparent, but we want to use a shadow catcher later and a shadow catcher is at the moment supported in Blender 3.1, which I use here as a beta, only in cycles. So let's go to cycles here. Get rid of these high settings here. So in the viewport, I want to have a noise threshold of 30%, so 0 0.3. Maximum samples, let's say 64, quite fast. And the same here for the rendering. Later for production, you can increase these values again, but we need this fast. So also get rid here of the denoising. So that's faster. And then we can go here into the film and set the background to transparent so that we can look now through the whole thing. Looks better for me. Another thing we now have to do is we need a shadow catcher setup. So let's select the ground here, which is here. It's visible again, but we look through it. So let's take a look here. We go into the object settings, into visibility, and make sure that Shadow Catcher is active. And we don't see anything here. Reason for this is we don't have a light source at the moment. Okay, let's get out here. We can stop the renderer for a moment. Let's make a light source, Shift A. Let's make a sun because it's quite convenient here to use the sun. And now we can look through that and I place my sun here. Let's take a look here. Now you see we have a shadow going on here. Normally you now search for a nice shadow. We make a little bit of a ground. We have talked about the shadow catcher setup before. So that's not the topic for today. Now you see it seems to integrate and now comes the big part. Does it really integrate if the camera is moving? So you can test that now here. To really make sure that it works, I go here now to frame 85, then the cube is gone. And let's make a test render of that. So let's go here. We only need the whole sequence to 85 because that's the highest value we need. Then cycles is set, transparent film is set. Start and end frame is set. Let's go to the compositing. Only test it with one frame here. So let's go to a frame 30. Click here to this little render icon. So now Blender is only rendering this frame into this node. Okay, it's rendering. And now you see that's the thing we have to look out. Like I said, next step normally is we have to go to the ground plane search an HDRI for the reflections, make a little bit the ground fitting here and you have to do your rotoscoping, all the stuff we've talked about. To finalize now this video here, what I do now is I render this now really fast with render animation and then we take a look into the whole thing and hopefully this will work. See you in a moment. Okay, Blender told me that the rendering is now done. So let's check the whole thing here. For this, I can go here to render and I can go to view animation. Normally Blender's animation player opens. I don't like this animation player too much. You know that. So what I've done is I've connected in the preferences. So I can show you here in the Blender preferences under, I think it is, where is it? file paths. 
here under application the animation player to custom and I use DGV here which is a free program which you can use. If I now click here you will see that now the animation opens in this free animation player and caches here directly. It takes a while because it's a bigger scene. And then I can start scrubbing here around and you will see that due to the fact that we don't have any parallax, the cube really stays where it belongs. And that's now closing this lesson here about a nodal shot. I hope I explained everything well. If you have any more questions, please ask in the comments below. If you like this tutorial, please subscribe and give me a thumbs up. And if you want to support this channel, you can become a patron of me. I'm really happy about that. And see you next time. You're Helge Maus. Have fun with Blender.